I think this is the latest I've been with one of these videos. Um, probably not the latest I'll ever be. But uh, this is what my self image for 2021, reflecting on 2020. So, 2020 was great. Um, super easy. We bought a home, that was great. Um, nothing else happened in the entire year. COVID stopped everything. Um, you were unemployed for a year again. That was great. Um, despite your best efforts. And by the time you got a job, uh, well, several things happened. You got a job at Amazon in March of 2021. Hurt. It sucked. But you got it and it paid well. And the idea was to just slave away there uh, in the Bezos salt mines until, uh, July. And, uh, at which point you would be able to take some leave from that company and focus on Ava. You would have made up enough money that you could, uh, take off for the time period safely. Um, that was the plan as of March 3rd or so when you got the job. On April 1st, uh, you were fired for the first time. Um, well, no, not the first time. Second time in your life. Uh, first time was <laughs> stupid, but a technicality. I'd missed a couple shifts while I had no car and there was a snowstorm. So I think two shifts. And that's why I got fired at, from uh, the IMAX when I was 17 or so. Uh, this was your first time getting fired as an adult. And uh, for the life of you, you don't know why. Um, according to their scanners, uh, which for if you don't remember, um, you had a scanner gun and a PlayStation 5. You'd scan the PlayStation, you'd put it on the shelf, you scan the shelf, repeat for 10 hours a day. Um, and according to their systems, you would scan the PlayStation, put it on the shelf, scan the shelf, stand still for 10 to 15 minutes, I'd scan another PlayStation, put it on the same shelf. And I had asked if I could see some footage. Um, they had a remarkably high amount of security, which I guess makes sense because it's a warehouse. There was a Nikon Z1, Z2, I don't know, Z something. One of the expensive Nikon cameras there. I know I know that that was expensive, but uh, for, for whatever reason, they couldn't bring up the footage despite knowing my location and the exact timestamps they'd need to, they'd need to look up. So, the first time that happened, you were told that you had accumulated two or two and a half hours of time off task in a day. You're not supposed to have more than 30 minutes, which is part of why I asked for the evidence, because I was very surprised by that number. Uh, there's no place to hide or sit down or relax in an Amazon warehouse, as the blisters are all over your feet can attest to. Um, however, I was not able to see the footage. I simply said, I will do my best not to repeat the mistake. The next day, no one talked to you. Uh, the day after, someone talked to you about the previous day that you thought you'd done okay on, saying the same thing, you accumulated two hours of time off task. Cool, um, so what does that mean? I was given the answer of someone will have to review it, meaning so it's someone else's problem, not mine or not theirs, I don't know. I was like, all right, I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but okay. And uh, on April 1st, you were summoned to the basement level at 11. <laughs> and uh, the woman who was there to fire me wasn't there yet. So they asked me to go back to work for two hours. And I thought about just leaving. I really just wanted to walk out the door because I'm like, I know why I'm here. I read the firing policy while I was waiting the initial time. It said if you get time off task over two hours in one week, you are fired instantly. Uh, I had accumulated four, so I was gone. I know I'm getting fired. That's why you summoned me here, um, but I'm stupid and I went back to work. Got called down around two and fired. Um, it was very impersonal. I have no ill will toward the individuals at Amazon, just maybe Jeff Bezos, but I have no clue what I did wrong, and I never will. So that was April. Now, uh... So that was April 1st. Uh, by the end of April, you had a job at a grocery store, stacking yogurt, making 11 bucks an hour. Um, not enough to survive, not nearly enough, but 
it was something. The Amazon residuals had still been there, the, the bits you had saved. So, you know, I had enough to get through April um, and my big stressor was getting into May. And sometime in the beginning of May, uh, David called, Lone Cricket, and he said he had a lot of work that needed to get done for May and June. And if I could help, he could use me basically every day for the next two months. And I had to very quickly run into the giant upper management and say, I'm so sorry, I need to quit. And I can't put in two week because uh, my new job starts like in two days or something like that. And they were very supportive. They were super helpful. And they said, oh, that's fine. Just sign this. Uh, and you're good. Um, don't want to burn a bridge because if I ever want to come back, I have I have Giant. Giant is literally five seconds away from my house. So even if it doesn't pay very much, um, I know what I'm doing. It's relatively easy and I can uh, drive there in less than five minutes, which saves a lot of gas. So since May, you've been working freelance. And in a lot of ways, this is kind of the dream. Um, for the longest time, and I'm sure I've said it on one of these, my version of success was making enough money to survive, meaning pay my bills and put away for savings, doing what I love. And for May, at least, that's exactly what happened. Um, you made enough money. You were able to pay all your bills and put some away. For June, um, sort of the same. There was more expenses in June that kind of popped up, but, you know, you still made some pretty good money and, you know waiting on some now and that's that's one of the things about freelancing is the waiting for your money to come in and uh, talking to accountants and talking about taxes and learning about taxes but honestly this is it this is the this is what you wanted and there's no uh guarantee of it staying this way but for this past two months you've been living you've been living exactly what you ever wanted to have in april you also got engaged and that was a long time coming <laughs> I should have done it four years ago, but I waited and, and I finally, with the Amazon job, I had enough money that I was like, you know what, that, that engagement ring that I've been looking at for the past few months, I can afford it. Bought it, it arrived after I'd been fired, but that's fine. And uh, I told my sisters and my mom, be on extremely high alert the day it's coming in, because if I'm planning on being there, but I had to be out in the morning. If it comes to the door and no one's there to sign it, they will take it back to the post office and we'll never find it. So they were all there and we got it and I hid it away. And at the end of April, we went to Bar Harbor and uh, it was unbelievably, un un unbelievably perfect. Um, it was freezing cold, it was windy. Uh, the ocean was gorgeous. The islands in the distance made it feel real. It was. I spent time sitting on the deck and just watching the waves. Um, I watched the sun go down more than once. I watched the sun rise more than once. Um, put on a jacket and just sat there because the other thing I've always wanted is to live not necessarily by the sea. Um, I've always loved mountains and I've always loved sort of rugged terrain. Not to hike it because I'm very lazy, but uh, to to live near it and to, to uh, exist in that sort of area. And the Bar Harbor Hotel gave us a very cushy version of that, where I was able to, if I chose, step out and see the might and the power of this of this nature, um, but then come back in and play The Last of Us or, or eat pizza or whatever it was. Also, the restaurant was great. I don't remember the name. I'll put it in here if I remember, but the restaurant was great too. So, Right now, the big thing, you're, you know, you're engaged, you're gainfully unemployed for the moment, um, and you're kind of in a, in a hazy spot of how exactly am I going to pay all my bills, but I guess in addition to that, the big thing on your mind is that Ava starts shooting in six days, five days, six days, and that is the scariest shit I have ever heard in my life. Um... Ava is a feature film. It's complicated. It's, uh, what's the word? Ambitious is a great catch-all term for this kind of movie. Um, and I am still wrestling with my own self-doubt. I still can't quite tell if it's good or good enough or 
whatever other words I can come up with. I don't really know yet. Um, and I'll find out. I mean, when I uh, first started writing it, I was going off of um, a prompt kind of given to me by Bree, who had been writing a similar story, the same story with the same characters. And slowly but surely we kind of forked off and I my project went in this direction and her project kind of stayed where it existed. And when she eventually just said, I'm, not, I'm done writing it, here, take it, do whatever you want with it, um, I took it in its own direction. And it's definitely different than the initial pitch, but it's not bad, I think. Um, I think the biggest fears are just coming from scheduling and money. Money is very scary. Um, everyone's working for no money, um, which if I could, they all deserve so much more than I can ever give them, but the only thing I'm making sure of is that they have coffee, bagels, eggs, food, just food ready to go, right? If I'm going to ask you to spend two weeks of your life, or at least yeah, it's two weeks straight, for everyone else it's kind of days sprinkled over that two-week period. If I'm going to ask you to spend that much time for no money, um, actively away from your paying jobs, um, I, the least I could do is make sure you're fed and make sure it's a fun environment. So. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure, mostly self-induced. The writing, I mean, I don't know if it's good enough, and I'll find out when I see it. And Sunday is the rehearsal, so Sunday is the first time because of COVID, fucking COVID, um, that I'll have everyone in the same room and be able to see my script and be able to make any last-minute changes. But the, the story's it's locked in, dude. It's staying the way it is, and it's not changing. And I think that's scary. Um... I've been living with the Ava character for a year and a half, two years, year and a half, and she's always been this sort of amorphous um, conglomeration of, of feelings and ideas that I've had. Um, and it's been really exciting because you can always sprinkle more and more and more, but eventually, you know, the dish needs to be cooked or the oven, the cake needs to be baked or whatever fucking analogy you want to come up with. Eventually, it needs to become a thing. And I guess last week I finally finished that rewrite that I was supposed to finish in May. And Ava became a finite character on a page. And I was upset a little bit. Um, not upset, but... I, the finite thing that she is, I'm very proud of. But it will never compare to that amorphous blob that didn't have to have a character arc. And didn't have to have lines of dialogue that was in, you know, the back of my head for so long. And it's something that I'm experiencing a little bit with the follow-up project, which I'm not really going to get into, but I'm working with Brooke on that. And I'm more, I'm, I'm going to, as much as possible, become intimately involved with my actors and become really, really sort of like, please tell me what you think of this character. Speak to me about her. Um, how would she react to this? What do you think about this idea? What do you think about this as her history? And how would that inform you as an actress? All that stuff, because what I learned with Ava so far is the little bits and pieces I got from Licia from the test footage and the little bits and pieces I've gotten from uh, Olivia from talking with her have been amazing. They've been, revel they've been revelatory. I've been, I went from unsure that Ava would ever be good to uh, very confident that at least the performances will be good based on about five seconds of test footage where I watched Licia break down crying unprompted and sell it and I was so amazed and so excited by that I was like fuck I wish we had done this a year ago I'd seen her cry she cried on um on the rehearsal on the table read over zoom too but that was with you know me reading half the lines and and it's a zoom call um this was the first time seeing it in person and watching it on camera and seeing her sell it and being like okay we're we're gonna be fine uh, so Ava gets shot soon. I don't have anything to say about it yet because there's not much to say. Um, I've been learning a lot about color grading. Uh, Cullen Kelly, I believe his name is. I'll link to his, his, to his uh, thing. I don't know which fucking side it's on. Um, his channel because he's... I've learned so much. Like just, just little things that I never even thought about. Um, Rereading everything Steve Yedlin has published on his website. Um... <laughs> posting to Insta to Facebook groups and getting told that I need a bounce board, which is fair. I mean, yeah, maybe I do need a bounce board, but I don't have 
the time to manage a bounce board, unfortunately. I have a bounce board. I just can't use it. I have, um, you know, the, I have no guaranteed anyone on set, actually. The only person that I know is going to be on set is myself and Austin as of right this second. Um, and he'll be on the boom operating. So if I'm on a tripod, I can probably get a bounce board set up. But if I'm going handheld, which is how I'm planning on doing a lot of it, there's how would I, how, how do you want me to do that? And, uh, it is four or five, maybe three people, um, were very adamant that I get a bounce board. And, and one guy said, why would you rush if you know it's going to be a subpar product? Is this a learning experience? I guess that makes sense. Um, why is there always such a, um, such something about amateurish? It was just very... I didn't realize how sensitive I was <laughs> until I'd uh, heard people call my stuff bad overtly and being like, yeah, your images would be a lot better if you had a bounce board. And I, I disagree only because I've seen the dynamic range of the actual image. There's plenty of information in the shadows. I just crushed it because I thought it looked nice. I don't know. Now I'm insecure about it. Now I'm thinking over, overthinking everything. But I mean, it's sort of the catch. Uh, guess catch point two of posting stuff to Facebook. Um, Ava has been getting way less attention than Mockingbird ever did. Way less uh, comments, way less reactions, way, way less of everything. And I know, you know, tying your self-worth to social media probably isn't smart, so I've been trying not to do that. But, you know, it's my baby, and, you know, I think, she, I think she's very pretty, and I think there's a lot to love there, and everyone's like, well, if you had a fucking bounce board. And I don't know what to say about it. And I've, I've talked to Brie about it, I talked to Austin about it, and they, you know, politely basically said, like, fuck them. But... You know, the problem is that I, I believe them a little bit. I'm like, oh, well, what if I did use a bounce board? I mean, this is not, this is naturally lit. This is a fucking window, and this is my actual lamp giving me that little side light. Um, it's how I like things. I like a high contrast ratio, and I'm, I mean, maybe I'm just lazy. I don't fucking know, but I don't think I'm lazy. I think it's more, um, I have an extremely limited time to get everything done. I don't want to spend 45 minutes lighting something. Um, though I've gotten with one of the benefits of working with David is that I've gotten experience using lights, um, and the aperture is 600 D's or something like that. They're, they're amazing and they're super powerful and I love them, but there's no time to set them up. Um, you know, the most I might do is bounce something off the ceiling to kind of bring up the ambient level of the room. If I'm shooting something particularly dark, um, but the reason I use the A7S and the reason I bought it in the first place was to be able to use practical light sources in my house that I have, like night lights in the walls and all this stuff. I got the non-flickering night lights specifically for this. Um, the reason I did that was to make sure that I could move quickly so I could focus any spare time, if it exists, on the performances, on directing, on, on doing the things that I actually want to do. Um, I think that Ava, and I guess by extension, the next thing, are going to be the last movies I do this way. Um, as in, I'm not going to be doing any feature films with no time and no money again. With the reason being, um, first of all, I'd like to be able to pay my actors. I'd like to be able to pay my crew if I were to have a crew. But also, just, just personally, I, I don't think I can afford this. I don't know if, I, if I'll make it in August. I don't know what we're going to do. Plus, we're saving for a wedding. Plus, we're, you know, there's a lot happening, and it's very expensive, and it's very scary. And that we'll get through it this time. We always do, but this can't be replicated. This can't happen every year. This can't happen every two years. Because the plan that I had in March was rock solid up until it wasn't. And, you know, it, it depended on Amazon being a job that I would have for so, so many months and not getting fired because I didn't think I'd ever get fired. And, you know, then I got excited when David called me and I was like, oh, my God, I can make so much money on this. And I, you know what? I made a lot of good money, but I'm not making $10,000 a month. I'm not making, you know, I don't have Nike as clients. I don't have any of those big brands that would be paying my bills like that. 
And maybe I will in the future. Maybe I will next year. I don't fucking know. But for right now, I'm a guy in Reading who shoots some good-looking stuff sometimes. And that severely limits um, my amount of income that I can make right this second. Um, you know, so much so that I'm, I'm now... Uh, so much so that I'm now uh, relying on weddings, relying on uh, freelance work that I haven't, you know, stoked the flames of in several years. So it's it's a it's an uphill battle of like I promise I can do this. I've done it before. Here's the examples, and just waiting and waiting and waiting. And even if you sign a wedding tomorrow, you know they may not be, they're not going to be doing it for a year and a half sometimes. So you know you get your five hundred bucks today and you give the thumbs up and you're like, all right, I'll see you in, I'll see you in 2023, you know, the thousand dollars I might make in three years is zero help for me right now. Um, so it's complicated. Life is complicated. Finances make it harder. My priorities right this second are get Ava done. Just get it done. Make it great as best as you can. Back it up. <laughs> like fuck and then immediately pause Ava work on the trailer for Left Unset that's what we're calling it right now it's a working title no idea what it'll be tomorrow but for right now it's called Left Unset shoot a trailer for that movie so we can raise money for it in Iowa come back with whatever money we would have raised which might be zero dollars and zero cents find a way to get Brooke here and shoot a talking head sort of promotional video with myself and her as a court creative team shot by David hopefully just because I need someone behind the camera I can edit them man that's yeah that's not this month that's that's the next couple months and on also on top of that work freelance also on top of that get a fucking accountant and get get it quickly because I've been trying to get in contact with accountants and they're just not replying to emails um uh, my freelancing game, uh, pay all my bills on time, save up for my fucking wedding, save up for my honeymoon. It's, it's a very hectic time, but something I've noticed too is like, there's never not a hectic time. The last year, nothing happened. And yet at the same time, everything changed. And it wasn't just the virus, even like the virus was a massive sort of background actor to what was actually happening. But we lost Michelle. We moved across the state. My entire family moved into my house and it became this taxing, toxic environment where it's like, I don't hate my sisters and I don't hate my mom, but now I hate my sisters and my mom. And it's like, what did they do wrong? Nothing. They're just stuck here, same as me. And, you know, Christina moved out and I realized I kind of miss her. And then I realized like, oh, fuck, I'm going to miss Carmen when she moves out. Oh, fuck, I'm going to miss my mom when they move out. But... It's that it's, I hadn't lived with them in seven years and now I was living 100% of my time with them. And it was, it wasn't right. And it was, you know, not, it's annoying and shitty because 2020 was supposed to be so many things for so many people and it ended up being none of those things. And the most heartbreaking thing is that there was virtually nothing we could have done about it. There's nothing we could have done about Michelle dying. There's nothing we could have done about COVID. There's nothing we could have done about my family moving in. Unfortunately, there's, there's just nothing that could have affected any of those things. And this year is about kind of picking back up as best we can, getting my mom and Carmen a place to live, getting my movies out the door and getting, um, getting left unsaid started because that might be the first project we work on that has a budget. I don't know yet. The budget might not, might just be the plane ticket to get Brooke here and we'll do it the same way we did Ava, which is, you know, I can do that. I can, I can, I can do that. I've established I can. Even if it's not ideal, I can do it. Uh, 2020 was hard. 2021 so far, um, hesitant, but it's been, it's worked out so far. Um, the hope is that this is the start of, this is sort of the bottom of the hill and now it's the uphill battle getting back up to wherever I want to be. I've, I've worked as a freelancer now. I have some contacts. I have some clients. 
Um, I have some possible regular work coming in. That's the most annoying thing about freelancing. It's always possible. Um, a friend of mine had uh, an editor sh shortage. He works in DaVinci Resolve. I've specifically been an editor in DaVinci Resolve for the past two months straight, working on four or five or six projects. All of them are very, very long. And they're, you know, it's it's in depth. You learn a lot by being thrown into the fire, so to speak. And I, I did, I learned a lot. And, um, you know, he, he says he has a lot of work coming down the pipeline, but you know, if one thing changes, if it's like, oh, you know what, we actually have, we, we have half the clients backed out until October. So we have, never mind, we don't have a shortage anymore. Or if it's just, you know, we don't like the way you edit this, we're not going to rehire you. Um, which I think he liked the last thing I did, but you know, I don't know. It's, it's so fickle and it's such a, and it has nothing to do with you half the time. But the alternative is go back to Giant and stack some yogurt, which I'm not pr too proud to do. I just don't want to. Um, and even the most annoying thing is that stacking yogurt at Giant, doing something that takes up a lot of my time, doesn't pay enough for me to justify it. So it's a, I'm gonna wrap this up. Money's hard, life is hard, being an adult fucking blows, and I thought I'd have kids by now, and I don't. So we're working on getting married, on going to Disney World finally, like we've been trying to since this time in 2018. Um, and we're going to do our best to keep keep this positivity, this this string of good luck, I would say, going. And make it uh, less of good luck and more of... Um, self-realized action. I want to be, I want to be the reason I'm successful as opposed to stumbling into it blindly. With my home, I just followed Brie. She bought it, I helped pay for it. That's all it is. I, I stumbled straight into home, home ownership. Um, I stumbled into David. I emailed him once last year and it just snowballed and it was a lucky chance that I had, that I took and you know, luck plays a large part in it, but you have to be ready to take that chance. You have to be ready to take what you want without, you know, screwing over people around you because I don't feel like you need to be Machiavellian about it. Um, you know, my business is on Google. My website is paid for for the next year. My galleries are all set up. Um, I've done maternity wor work now, which is really useful. Um, you know, it's just, it's a very good time. I'm in a very good space right now. It's just a matter of, you have all this built up kinetic and potential energy. You got to move it. You got to move the kinetic energy forward. But when there's a lot of potential, it takes a lot to move it. So it's, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult, but as established by losing a job at Amazon, you can fail at doing shit you don't even like. So you might as well try for the thing you want to do. And that's what I'm doing. I'm going to spend the next year, as responsibly as I can, uh, actively chasing my dreams and making sure that I can say with confidence by this time next year, I'm ready to be a father, um, not just emotionally, but financially, we can have kids now. My first one of these was more than five years ago now, which is strange, but it was more than five years ago now. I don't know if I had a five-year plan. Right now I'm 25. In five years, I'll be 30. Um, I'm going to state my five-year plan for myself. Hopefully, I reach it. If I don't, hopefully, I reach the best parts of it. I want to be a father, first and foremost. I want to have my kids. Um, hopefully, I mean, you know, I say I want two. Maybe I'll have three. Maybe I'll have ten. Um, but regardless of how many kids I have, I hope that I can be a good father to them. I hope that I don't traumatize them too much uh, in, in relation to how everyone else's parents traumatize their, their kids. Um, I want to be a good husband. I want to make sure that I don't replicate the mistakes that I had to live through or that my or that Brie had to live through or any of my family had to live through. And I want to be full-time small business freelancing video and photo and editing and anything else, a generalist, I guess, because 
that would pay my bills. But specifically, I think I want to be a filmmaker in five years. Someone who is a working filmmaker. Someone who is, um, you know, maybe I'm directing commercials. Maybe I'm directing films. Maybe I'm directing whatever it is. A working director who makes his money doing specifically filmmaking, doing specifically that sort of thing. I think I can get there. Um, how is a little bit more complicated, but I think I can get there. So yeah, I don't know what my five-year goal was five years ago, but my five-year goal now is to be a filmmaker, a father, and a husband in five years and be uh, maybe just content for once in my life before starting the next goal and challenging myself. I think that's a good place to end it. Uh, yeah. Good luck to me.